Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to worship. It is great that you can join us today. For members of Westminster, I do want to remind you that next week at 1130, there will be a congregational meeting. The purpose of the meeting is to give information about a grant proposal that would allow us to add staff and build a warehouse that would uh, house a food pantry. Um, we hope that you join us and information is available uh, about this meeting, but that's next week at 1130. Of course, we have our regular worship service at 10 o'clock next week. Let us be in the attitude of worship and unite together in the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen to reign. His is the name above all names. Come away from rush and hurry to the stillness of God's peace. From our vain ambitions worry, come to Christ to find release. Come away from noise and clamor, life's demands and frenzied pace. Come and join the people gathered here to seek and find God's grace. In the pastures of God's goodness, we lie down to rest our soul. From the waters of God's mercy, we drink deeply, are made whole. At the table of God's presence, all the saints are richly fed. With the oil of God's anointing, into service we are led. Come then, children, with your burdens, life's confusions, fears, and pain. Leave them at the cross of Jesus, take instead his kingdom train. Bring your thirst, for he will quench them, he alone will satisfy. 
All our longings find attainment when to self we gladly die. If we say we have no sin, we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us unite in the prayer of confession. O Lord our God, you call us to work for a world where all will be fed and have dignity, but we find ourselves distracted by our own desires. You call us to seek justice and peace, but we are satisfied with injustice and discord. You call us to bring liberty to the oppressed, but we do not insist on freedom for all. Forgive us, O Lord. Turn us to your will by the power of your Spirit, so that all may know your justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let us unite in these words of assurance. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God is doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as a forgiven people, let's remember what Jesus said. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name.
Uh, let's back up a slide so everybody has a chance to read what led to that remarkable piece. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for sharing your music with us today. Let us unite in the prayer for illumination. Testify to us, O God, by the voice of your Spirit. Put your law in our hearts. Write your word in our minds. And show your will in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. We read from chapter 12, verses 26, and part of verse 27. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. And then turning to 1 Corinthians, we read from chapter 15, verses 1 to 26, and verses 51 to 57. The Apostle Paul addresses the church at Corinth and writes, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished if for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. 
For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put, put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then resuming the reading at verse 51. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I do want to mention that if you have a prayer request, we ask that you uh, send it as a comment on Facebook, and it will be included with the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Gracious God, this day as we come to your word, give us its hope, its power, and its life. Help us grow in grace and faithfulness so that we may better reflect your glory. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The last century had some interesting understandings of sin. The uh, popular evangelist Billy Sunday uh, talked about being saved from the sin of baseball during his uh, rather energetic preaching. Uh, he was known for he was a former baseball player, and he was known for sliding across the stage and coming to safety away from the devil. He was uh, quite a speaker. And, you know, now our perspective is different. We don't think baseball is a sin. And I remember growing up, my dad sometimes complaining that he'd never learned to dance because the church he belonged to at the time said, well, dancing is a sin. And how often our efforts to understand what sin is about has reduced it to trivial things. Do you go and buy a loaf of bread on a Sunday? Can you mow the yard on a Sunday? All those questions that really have so little to do with what sin is about in Scripture. Now, the first letter that Paul wrote to Corinth is full of this issue of sin and salvation because this was a church that really knew what sin was about. Um, they had problems with morality. Uh, Paul has to call them up short several times about the fact that it isn't appropriate for some of the things you used to do in your old life, like stopping by the brothel, well, that's not appropriate for you to do now that you are a Christian. And he also takes up an issue that is really odd to us about all the good restaurants were located near the temples, most of the meat that was uh, taken from the butcher shops, had been offered up to an idol before it got to you. And if your memory 
was that idols were real and that that old religion still had power over you, maybe you didn't want to do that anymore. But the truth is, when they were offered up to idols, they weren't really offered up to anything, and so you're free to eat that meat. Maybe it's best just not to ask. Throughout scriptures, the issue of sin is an issue that says it's what estranges us from God. It's what moves us away from life. It what takes away our joy. And so if you spend your life in bitterness and anger, there's no question that you've moved away from joy and hope and moved into a darkness, a distress that leads you away from God. If you are consumed with greed to the point where you worry about someone else's good fortune, well, that takes you away from what your life is about. If you can't bear to see someone else succeed, if you're always so competitive that you alone have to be the winner, well, how is it that you can find any fun? And so, the issue of sin in Scripture is the issue of moving away from the life that God wants to offer to the issue of death, those things that take life away from us. The fears, the prejudices, all the things that keep us from enjoying what God has provided in this world. So, as Paul addresses the church at Corinth, he wants to make sure that they look again at what happens when God gives life in the resurrection. Resurrection becomes the symbol and the focus for Paul's argument here, and it's good for us to return to it. The problem wasn't life after death. I mean, the whole ancient world believed in life after death, more or less. They had images of a future for them in which the soul, the immortal part, will go on and be with God. But the Christian understanding was much different. And it said that what happens finally is that God makes us all new, including the body. And we are raised from the dead. And in this we join Christ. Christ becomes the example for us in death, just as Christ is the example for us in life. And this ultimate resurrection represents God's final triumph over the world. It's as if we'd skipped ahead in the mystery story and read the final chapter. We know how this story ends. And it's how the story is continuing right now that our life and world is in God's hands, just as our future rests in God's hands. And that future does not end with our death, but holds with it this promise of eternal life, of newly risen life, that goes on and on in an eternity of perpetual joy. That is the vision of the Christian faith, that our lives will be made new in God's hands, and our bodies, hopefully fixed, will be resurrected. Um, you know, I've often wondered, will my resurrected body, will my beard no longer be gray? I, I think that would be a good thing. I would, you know, I'd sort of like it to match. And we probably all think those things about, yeah, there are parts of me I'd really like fixed on the resurrection. But just like so many other things that we think about or worry about, maybe we don't have to worry about those things. 
somehow in God's hands, our risen bodies will be made whole and perfect for the new creation that we dwell in. So having seen this great promise, Paul wants to make it clear that we get to step into that promise in our life even now. And we want to hold on to the theme of the resurrection as we move away from sin and move to new life in Christ. As you read through this letter to the Corinthians, and I think it's a really good idea, pick up your Bible, you might have time on your hands, read the letter to the Corinthians, and you discover a church that is struggling with its fellowship. It's struggling with its morality. It's struggling with what to do in worship. And finally, it is struggling with its belief. All the things that we think make up church are somehow in trouble in Corinth. And yet Paul has no question about addressing them as Christians. For the essential questions of who do you belong to? Who do you follow? Where does your hope lie? Is satisfied for the Corinthians even though they have so many problems. You know, the church now also has these same kinds of problems. There's conflict, there's questions about how to worship, there's questions about what we should believe, and even about how we live out our faith. But in the midst of all those questions, if we return to the one who is the source of our hope, if we turn back to Christ, we are going to find a way to move ahead. We'll find the source of our unity. And finally, we will find the source of our life. Now, as Paul takes up this issue and says that the last enemy to be destroyed is death, sometimes it's easy to take issue with that. All of us have witnessed times when the passing of a loved one seemed like a real blessing. That after the struggle they had at the end of their life, well, it is a gift to know that finally that struggle is ended. But what gets destroyed and why death is an enemy is the way it adds to fear, the way it takes away life, the way it keeps us from drawing closer to God. And this fear of death, this fear of a future that is unknown, this inability to deal with our own mortality makes it an enemy. And to know that that enemy has been set aside by Christ is a remarkable gift. It is true that in a fallen world, death comes as a blessing to some. But it's also true that we can hope for so much more as we turn again to the resurrection. Dietrich Bonhoeffer will talk about the way that in the face of great loss, it isn't so much that God fills the space, but rather that God holds the space open so that our memories of the loved one can survive there. I think that's a remarkable understanding, and it's useful for us to turn to that passage and to think about what happens as Paul tells the church of Corinth, quoting from a, po a poem, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Death can no longer move us away from God. Instead, we have a promise that triumphs over death. 
and death as it comes to us in those sins that keep us from God's love have also been triumphed over as we draw closer and closer to Christ. As we cling to Christ, as we trust in his love and find his hope, may we know that death has been conquered and the fears and the limitations and the sin that come with it can also be set aside. All praise and thanks to God for such a powerful hope. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us unite in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to our prayers today, we have these prayer requests. We request, have a request for prayers for the family of Diane Demers, uh, her father died yesterday. It, his name is uh, William Demers, and he died at the age of 93. Uh, we certainly think of him and his family in this time of loss. There's a prayer for our world in the midst of COVID-19, for strength and recovery for all who are sick, for safety and protection for medical workers and their families, for wisdom for our government leaders and for all of us. Give us wisdom, patience, and tolerance as well. We also ask for prayers for Virginia Hadley. Uh, she's in intensive care at Kishwaukee Hospital, and uh, we pray for her at this time. I want to also ask for prayers for my father-in-law, William Taylor, who is uh, back home from the hospital as he continues to recover from a heart attack. Uh, we pray for his continued progress. With these concerns in mind, let us come to God in prayer. Loving God, you cause rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Hear our prayers for your church and the world. For the hungry and for the overfed, may we have enough. For the mourners and the mockers, may we laugh together. For the victims and the oppressors, May we share power wisely. For the peacemakers and the warmongers, may clear truth and honest love lead us to harmony. For the silenced and the propagandists, may we speak our own words in truth. For the unemployed and the overworked, May our mark on this earth be kindly and creative. For the troubled and for the secure, may we live together as wounded healers. For the homeless and the pampered, may our lives be simple and may we be people that are warm and welcoming. For the vibrant, and for the dying, may we all die to sin 
and live in love. Hear us, gracious God, as we remember the prayers, requests offered this day, and those prayers that we offer now in the silence of our hearts. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time of uh, taking the offering, we do invite uh, all of you to think about what you have set aside, both in terms of your gifts of service and your gifts of money to God. Uh, This is our pledge campaign time and we ask uh, all people to return their pledge cards to the church so that we can better plan for our future as a congregation. Let us now offer our gifts to God. To the great one in three, the highest praises be, hence evermore, thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world 
confess thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. and their might, thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight, thou, in the darkness, drear their one true light, Communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle in glory shine, yet all are one in thee for all are thine. wide bounds from oceans farthest coast through gates of pearl streams in the countless host singing to God has shown you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Now to the one who is able to keep you from falling, and to make you stand without shame in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority, before all time, and now, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.